This is exactly right. Oh, <laughs> buddy. Uh-oh. I got a good one for you. I love when you do. Researchers studying daddy long legs genes created a daddy short legs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, you get enough people focused on one problem and amazing things can happen. I can't wait to hear more on Bananas. Guys, gals, non-binary pals, welcome to Bananas. Uh, that's Scotty Landis right there. That stand-up comedian, Kurt Brownoller, who will be taping. By the time you hear this, it will have taped. How are you feeling? Are you excited about your Denver specials? I am very excited about my Denver specials. Um, and also, I do. we do have a shout-out right away. Oh, good. shout-out right at the top of the show. Way cooly. Um, because you know, you know, it's late. Recently, we started saying guys, gals, and nine binary pals. I was, we we're always looking for a for a, a pithy way to say yeah. that idea, smooth. And uh, and it, actually, I have to give a shout out because guys, gals, and non binary pals was the idea of Adrian from Denver. They are uh, at Sex Death Rebirth on Instagram, and so just a shout out for that yeah. fantastic. Uh, we like for it. That fantastic pithy little way of saying the thing we, we love to it. Say exactly. It doesn't matter what you are. Come and be a banana. We accept everybody exactly as they are, how they feel. How are you feeling? Good. You have been on jury duty. Yes. Tell so me. we're ta- all right. So we're recording uh, at eight p.m. Kurt and I usually don't do this because we are uh, performer writers. So we have a lot of free time during the day. Yeah. Not anymore. I went to jury duty. I got summoned. I postponed it three times because of the great quar. So I got to the point where you have to go. And I go in, and I think I've I've probably gotten called into jury duty five times. You've been called before, right? Yes, yeah, so I haven't. The only the, the, both times that I've been called were like right after Lauren had given birth. So I was just uh-huh. like, "Look, I have a brand new baby at home." They're like, "All right, get out of here." Cool. So I'd never been on a jury before. Um, so I go in, and I, um, you have a juror summons as a juror ID. It's like four digits on there. So I show up, and I go to the courthouse downtown, and um, there's about 40 jurors. And this clerk comes out, and she's like, guys, uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. It, we know you don't want to be here, <laughs> which is very funny. <laughs> also, this clerk, I wish I could say her name, but I can't, but she is fantastic. Um, and she goes, so I'm going to call out everybody's juror ID number. Uh, it's on your card. It's four digits. It's next to the words juror ID. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And uh-huh. so I, it's very easy to find. And she goes, and when I call your name, say here and then walk down and I'm going to give you a badge. And so there's 40 of us or so. People are filing in. And so she starts saying numbers. She starts saying things 3619, 2714, whatever it is. And people are going, wait, what are we doing? And she, she says, Guys, I'm going to say your juror ID number. It's four <laughs> digits. It's on your summons in your hand. When I call your name, say here and then come get your jury batch. And so they go, okay. So this takes, I don't know. I'm not going to, I won't be hyperbolic at all during this entire thing. I won't exaggerate it at all. This part alone, just get 40 people, 40 badges, <laughs> takes 15 minutes. <laughs> People are going, what number is it? Everybody's leaning over, and I'm like, it's that one right there. It's that one right there. And I'm pretty late in the process. So I get my badge number here. Go get it. I come sit back down. This Another woman comes in. The woman's sitting next to me on this bench. We're all masked up, too. Everybody's yeah. in a mask. It's a federal building or whatever, or a state building. And so this woman next to me just keeps turning this paper over and over in her hands. And this other woman goes, what is happening? And before I can say... Check your juror ID number. She's calling numbers. Go get your badge. The woman just looks at me and looks at the woman and goes, I don't know what the hell is going on. Now, I'll jump ahead a little bit because that woman wasn't a juror. <laughs> that woman that said that was just on the wrong floor of the building. So she was there. So with she was very confused. 
<laughs> it was yeah. a very weird for her. Yeah, I think she was trying to find. She was a there courtroom. for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cafeteria is on the first floor, lady. <laughs> I've been so... trying to eat all this paper since I sat down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why does everybody get up? What are those numbers? <laughs> so. So then we all get our badges, which is honestly a, a waking miracle that that actually happened. Yeah. And then the uh, nice clerk who goes, great job, guys. Amazing. So what's going to happen is I have a tin here. It's a little heart-shaped tin canister looking thing. She goes, there's plastic clips inside. Everybody grab a clip and then pass it down. These are for your badges. You're going to pin your badge to your shirt. And so the first guy gets it. I'm watching because now I'm fully invested in yeah, what yeah, everybody's doing yeah. because I am seeing the judicial system <laughs> happen. At work. I'm seeing my peers. Yes. Um, all of our peers. First guy takes uh, – he's about, I don't know, 50 yards away from me. These hallways are long. And uh, he takes the clip and puts his badge on and then just sits the canister down next to him and does not pass it. <laughs> <laughs> right out of the gate. Num- guy number one. <laughs> So then she goes, sir, can you pass those down? Everybody uh, take a clip, pass it down. (laughs) So then it goes for a little while, and I sort of lose track of it. More people are showing up. People are like, I just got here. She's like, come on down. We'll get you a badge. Keep those clips going. So just getting the clips separately from the badges, easily another 10 minutes. Now we're supposed to be in there at 10 a.m., I think. So now it's about 1030. She goes, well, guys, we're going to line you up by number. I won't even get into that because that took – that was – it was like putting 45 puppies in uh, a bag as big – like in a sandwich bag. It was like, how can we possibly make this happen? So finally, the clips get back around to the lady. Her, her thing's almost empty, and she goes, okay, does anybody here still need a clip? <laughs> Like 15 people <laughs> raised their hand out of the 40. So, like, they, <laughs> they just, just kept passing it down. <laughs> they didn't know what was going on. I don't know what they... I mean, look around at the other people. Are you so nervous? <laughs> so then these 15 people have to stand up and just walk of shame through all of us and go one at a time eclipse. And then they come back and they're like, okay. And so... <laughs> it was crazy. It was nuts. It thinned out the herd. Oh, man. All right. Enough about that. Let's get back to some good old-fashioned bananas. Um, all right. You want to hear about this uh, Daddy Short Legs? <laughs> yes. I do want to hear about Daddy oh, Short man. Legs. Oh, I, man. I've been trying I've been trying to research it because I read this article. There's not a ton to the article, but I, I'll get into it Fine a little with bit. with me. But, the, but the, there is a comic in Los Angeles who has a joke about Daddy Long Legs. Where it's, and I, I was trying to figure out who it was. I thought it was maybe Alan Strickland Williams, and I was like oh, yeah. asking around, and I, can't, I don't know who it is. So if this okay. is a joke, I apologize, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it. But of like, think about the scientist who was just like, I've discovered a new s- <laughs> species of spider. <laughs> Daddy Long Legs. <laughs> Um, uh, the creepiest name for a spider in the world, but Daddy Short Legs is even worse. I think. yeah, and my favorite rock band of all time is Van Halen, and they were Gene Simmons from Kiss kind of discovered them, and he goes, "You can't use the name Van Halen. You guys have got to use the name Daddy Long Legs." <laughs> no way, really? That's what <laughs> That's he said. True. And they were like, "We're going to use Van Halen, the coolest last name ever invented." <laughs> No, you guys got to be Daddy Long Legs. Daddy Long- I'm a moron. I named my band Kiss. <laughs> uh, so this article, this was sent in by Carrie Rancourt on uh, on Thanks, Instagram. Carrie. This is from NPR, written by Bill Chappelle. Mm-hmm. He's damn good at what he does. Um. So this is, I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of information on it. To get an idea of why scientists would want to study daddy long legs. Try, yes, queen. I can't get over the name. <laughs> try playing a game of one of these things is not like the others next time you see one. If mm-hmm. you watch a daddy long legs move. Also, to people who live in Australia, I don't think they have daddy long legs. So it must no. be extra funny. Yes. Uh, if you watch a daddy long legs move, it will effectively move on just three pairs of its legs. Good to know. And the remaining pair of legs, he adds, just wave around in the air, <laughs> probing the arachnid surroundings, which it does. You see, it's just like they're just reaching for things that aren't yeah. there. And they yes. see, see something interesting, they can grab it. And mm-hmm. so what, they're, what they were trying to do is apparently they have... No, they can they can like actually wrap their legs around things because their the legs are segmented so many okay. times. That's cool. So they you know took apart the jeans and then they put some jeans back together and made a daddy short legs. 
Um, but here is the one interesting thing that I read about th- that okay. I found out about this, which is this. Um, <laughs> two things actually. The legs also have another special characteristic, a survival tactic that scientists refer to as autotomy. The arachnids' legs can, quote, detach themselves from the body, a trick used to distract predators while the daddy log legs runs away with the remaining legs. Yes. (laughs) Love that. Love that. I love that. I love that. Imagine if that was a human thing. You get scared, your legs fall off, and you run away on your hands. (laughs) (laughs) Just army crawl out of the room, out the dog door, into a waiting limousine down the street. (laughs) Um, Also... Here, one of the biggest, and this is the last thing I'll say about this, we'll move on. whatever you want. One of the biggest misconceptions is that they are venomous, but are too, quote, weak to inflict a bite. I've heard that so many times. I've heard that so many times. I thought, it's such a weird fact. I was like, there's no way it can't not be true. Um, Okay. they, They neither have venom, nor do they bite. Great. There they go. So Daddy Long Legs. I don't mind a Daddy Long Leg. Oh, right? Don't mind them at all. I find it up close, pretty damn creepy looking, but... I just move them outside. I yeah. move them outside. They never like bothered me at all. Never my bothered me for bed. one second. Yeah. Some, sometimes I do <laughs> get rid of them then. <laughs> you should. I've always heard that. That's so. Yeah, I was always heard that they, they're the most poisonous spider, but their fangs can't pierce the human skin. It's so, Why? I mean, like, that. that is the gerbil up the butt of uh, spider yeah. stories. You the know, it's Richard like, Gere, where did it start? Where did right. it start? Why did it start? I love pre-internet it. memes, pre-internet viral memes. Yes. What's from your cousins? I've, I think I've said that on the podcast before, <laughs> but my theory is cousins were the original internet. Your cousins are how information spread yeah. up until the internet. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. I, I was joking in the open that this is something stupid to study, but watch them go and make like, oh, good. Now we understand yeah. how to regrow missing limbs in humans in 20 years because of the research we did on shorty daddy legs or daddy short legs. <laughs> shorty daddy legs. <laughs> There's the name. There's the name of the episode, shorty daddy legs. <laughs> well, it's because I'm <laughs> sipping that Bulgarian vodka you brought me, that green mark vodka. How is it? It's, it's, you know, vodka is one of those things that it tastes so similar no matter where you go. Yep. It's all about the same. So I'll say it goes down smooth. It tastes great. But it tastes a little better because you brought it to me. A little sweeter. There you go. Tastes like some sweet, mm. sweet water. Give me a story, Scotty. Okay, this is a fun one. Sadie McFady sent this in. <laughs> yes, Sadie McFady. <laughs> I like Sadie McFady. That was a great name. Uh, written by Joe Kinsey for... <laughs> Outkick.com. Oh, classic Outkick.com. When I get up early before the sunrise and pour a nice nice bowl of chai and get in my comfy (laughs) reading chair, I always open up Outkick.com. For the outdoor enthusiast who loves martial arts, (laughs) (laughs) Outkick.com. I found this everywhere. Sadie actually sent it from a different site, but I thought this was a funnier take on this story. Thank you, Joe Kinsey. You are... You actually are the best in the business. Naked Tennessee man arrested for floating down a river while singing God Bless America as loud as he can while running from a bail bondsman. <laughs> Wait, what? Well, I, that second part, I had, ne- had not heard that second part. Yeah, they, oh. exactly. I found a better headline and yeah. only on Outkick.com. Thank you, Outkick. Outkick.com. If you get three or four clicks from, from the Banana Boys, <laughs> let us know. We'll send so much traffic your way. <laughs> This one sounds like it's straight out of Florida, but it actually went down on the Nalachucky River near Greenville, Tennessee. That's Not where the Nate, Nalachucky. That ooh, that sweet, creamy Nalachucky River. Um, that's where naked Tennessee man Troy Hunt. That, that is the yeah. most Tennessee name I've ever heard. Isn't it Troy Hunt? I mean, Troy you, Hunt. Troy you just will can't hunt. Do it, uh, Troy will. <laughs> That Troy will float naked. He was arrested after leading authorities down a wild, uh, on a wild chase down the river as he sang God Bless America and floated on debris, looking a bit like Tom Hanks in Castaway. <laughs> now, it's unclear why Hunt jumped in the river, but he eventually ended up naked. He thinks the current ripped off his shorts. <laughs> oh, that happens all the time, Kurt. Yeah, of course. Those currents... That are unbuckling shorts. <laughs> you know, you love swimming in the ocean as much as I do. We ride waves. We get, you know, your shorts are just <laughs> constantly being ripped off by water. 
Oh, Hunt refused to be rescued by emergency personnel who threw life vests at the 52-year-old <laughs> because he didn't like the tone of the rescuer's voices. <laughs> Oh, you got to rescue me proper. I'm Troy Hunt. Ask nice. My pants just got ripped off by a rip current. Um, according to a report obtained by the Greenville Sun, Hunt told police that rescuers, quote, had yelled at him, which hurt his feelings so much he refused the ropes and flotation. <laughs> hurt his feelings. Oh, cops noted that their report uh, did show Hunt had signs of being intoxicated. Oh, yeah. Just you, in, you, know, you think? Just in case you were wondering what's going on there. Um, but according to his bail bondsman, Carrie Emmett, who was hunting for his client. I didn't realize bondsmen called their their people that take bonds out with them clients. That's yeah. good to know. Uh, he's facing a third DUI. We don't support DUIs on Mm-mm. bananas. Third, A uh, third DUI. Jesus. Yeah, take the river next time, Troy. <laughs> um, Carrie Emmett said, we need to get him help on Facebook. Um, this is the best detail of all. Hunt covered 15 miles in two hours. Wow. That's that a is, serious flow. That's a real... Kurt, maybe maybe the Kurt did rip his pants off. <laughs> He's going seven and a half miles an hour. That's pretty fast for a current. Pretty damn good. Hunt's on the hook for indecent exposure, disorderly contact, and public intoxication charges, along with his troubles, the bail bondsman and the local courts say. Troy Hunt, if no more DUIs, buddy. Wow. I mean, so he was in an active chase. And yep. then just jumped in. And, you know, we often say that if you're being chased or you're trying to get away, the water is always the worst way to go. It's very slow. Someone We've talked could about just it. walk right next to you <laughs> the whole way. Because they know where you're going. They know yeah. where you're going. Oh, they do. I know. I just love that so much. I love, like, I love an escape plan that's so foolish. But yeah. then also when you realize you're busted... And you just embrace the sweet current and float. <laughs> I mean, floating face up, singing "God Bless America." That has to knock some time off his court. I mean, our. I mean, he has to. <laughs> like the guy loves his country. <laughs> it, it. I mean, you can never get in. You can never get into the mind of a Troy Hunt. Uh, but. I hope I hope it was just, you know, he was just excited. I, he was excited by the beauty presented to him by the United States at that yeah. moment. Were he you was, a big, uh, I think I know the answer to this, but I, I don't know. Were you a big skinny dipping guy in like high school and college? Like, was it a thing to get naked and jump in a pool or the ocean or whatever? Yeah, pro- like skinny dipping would always, I think I would often get naked. Yes. Just to get naked. Um, I love that for you. Not anymore. I'm happy I've well, gotten over that. Well, you've done the naked that. bike rides, too, right? Didn't you do a naked bike ride, or was that just for a photo shoot? That was just for a photo shoot. <laughs> what a normal <laughs> thing to say to your friend. <laughs> yeah, now that was a photo shoot, and it was like right after I started comedy. It was probably like 2004 or something, and uh, it was in Dumbo. It was in yeah. Dumbo in Brooklyn, and uh, it's just me totally naked on a bike, uh, just riding around on cobblestones with yeah. people like very shocked yeah. <laughs> seeing it. Um, but yeah, no, I, I've never done a naked bike ride other than that. But no, uh, to answer your question, I haven't done a ton of skinny dipping because skinny dipping to me always seemed like there was like a sexy element to it. Yeah, And right. my nakedness was always just com- pure comedy. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yes, Where skinny I do. dipping is like somebody's, somebody's, somebody's getting a ding dong. Yeah, you know that's saying? right. Somebody's having uh, bad sex in the ocean yes. tonight. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, just wondering. I never. I'm the same way. I treat skinny dipping like karaoke. It's like I'll go if you want me to go. I'll go. I probably won't enjoy it, but if mm-hmm. you're having a great time, I'll join in. I'll I'll hop in for the ride. But also, I mean, plug the plug the children's ears. But sex in the water seems like it would be wonderful. It That's is true. not. Nope. It is not enjoyable. It is not easy. You would think there would be a lot of, like, uh, make it easier or more fun, and it doesn't. It's the opposite. Not even on a water bed. Not great. 
<laughs> All of it. I've never even laid on a waterbed. Oh, I'm so jealous. Oh, God. One of my ex-girlfriends from, I mean, 15, 20, God, 15 years ago, her whole family, every room had waterbeds. Every oh single member God. of their family had waterbeds. They were just like, we are a waterbed family. Yeah. I had to look into it when I was living in New York because she's like, can you get a waterbed there? And in New York, I don't think you can because of oh, like renter's yeah. rights right, because right, if it right. like bursts in your mm-hmm. building and leaks down. But yeah, so I slept on a lot of waterbeds. And I, this is not my joke, but I once heard this said that sex on a waterbed is like bouncing a basketball off a shower curtain. And it's the <laughs> funniest analogy. It's just you, you give and it just doesn't really give back. <laughs> Is it oh. is it comfortable? Is it comfortable to sleep on? Uh, it can be. There's a lot of more adjustable. I mean, also I was young. I feel like right. when you're it young and matter. you, yeah, you just could sleep. Yeah. You could sleep on the stairs. You can sleep standing up. You can sleep in your car. When mm-hmm. you're like, when you're 17 to 24, you can sleep literally anywhere on anything. Yes, exactly. Um, tee us up, big boy. All right, this one we'll go to a we'll go to a little break. I can't wait. There it is. I'm having fun. Some scientists believe the universe is conscious. Oh, okay. I mean, you are talking to two stupid guys, and I hope I understand one word you say on a little bit more. Bananas podcast. And we are back, Scotty. How you Feels doing? good. Feels good to be back. I feel great. I realized my AC was on, so if you hear something weird in the background, a weird blowy sound, it was just that. I've turned it off. I can't hear it. I can't hear it. I got mine going. I'm inside. I'm never inside. I'm inside I know, for I this noticed. one. It's really nice. I didn't want to dox you, but I totally noticed. <laughs> and now I'm, of course, you know, if you're listening to the show, Mm-hmm. It would mean a lot for you to go and rate and review uh, the show for us. Just go yeah. on over to Apple Podcasts and, and do it up. Um, yes. And I'm very excited because we have a new we have a new segment, Scotty, don't we? We're introducing a new segment. The people love segments. It's been proven <laughs> on chat shows for years. Um, and this was a segment pitched to us by our mm-hmm. intern, Lisa mm-hmm. Maggot. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, ladies and gentlemen, for the very first time, please welcome to Bananas, the intern, Lisa Maggot. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We're so glad to have you. Honestly, we're glad so people just know that Kurt and I didn't make up a fake, like, Svengali intern. <laughs> Lisa, you are real. I am real. Where do you live? I live in New York City. Perfect. The Big Pretty Windy. Good. Oh, I love the New York big City. Big Windy on the Hill. <laughs> and um, Lisa helps us with organizing all the emails you send, all the DMs you hit us with on the Bananas Podcast at gmail.com. But also, we have this new BOB segment. Lisa, Best you want to tell us? Some- yeah, best of bananas. That's right. So uh, Lisa's gone through uh, old episodes and pulled and kind of organized them by concept. Like we we've done so many stories at this point, but uh, certain themes tend to uh, jump out. And so for the very first time, Lisa, please give us this week's best of bananas. Mm-hmm. All right. So this week's best of bananas is uh-huh. asshole birds. Asshole? <laughs> <laughs> birds that are jerks or the... Oh, okay. birds I mean, jerks. It could be. I mean, we do have a lot of asshole stories also. <laughs> but birds who are assholes. Okay, great. Let's, wow. let's hear the best birds who are assholes. All right. So first is Parrot mm-hmm. tells Firefighter to fuck off. <laughs> I remember this one. That was like back in like... The, it was like his like second episode, I think. Was that's a long yeah? Was that a house that was on fire and somebody went to rescue a parrot and it told the fireman to fuck off? I believe so. Yeah, perfect, perfect story. Yeah, great story. <laughs> High up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we have just some kind of like badass bird story, mm-hmm. which is Emu's Carol and Kevin banned for life from Australian Outback Pub. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. We, we're we strongly against banning emus from pubs. Uh, let them in. Let we them like in. all birds and bars. Are you kidding me? That would be the one bar I would go to if there was two emus that hung out yeah. regularly. I'm in. Yes, I'd buy them drinks. Okay. Oh, yeah. Number Although four, emu, so no. drunk emus are kind of crazy. I've yeah. heard of them before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we ready for the next one. Number three. Number three is two penguins apprehended after sneaking back into sushi shop they were already kicked out of. Yes. Mm -hmm. This was in New Mm -hmm. Zealand. I did that one. I know, I remember this one. I I love that one. I mean, who? again, we like birds and businesses. (laughs) We support birds and businesses on Banana. Bird in the biz. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, And then... Lastly, in the like official list is okay. Oakland's notoriously aggressive turkey captured by wildlife expert posing as frail woman. <laughs> yes, I remember that turkey would only attack old women, and so that's why they dressed up as an old woman to catch it. I love that one. Oh, mm, mm, oh mm, man, mm. that's great. It feels good to hear these again. They just oh, they they go in the ears so smoothly when you've already heard them once. I love this. Yeah. There's one more, right? And these are kind honorable of mentions? honorable mentions. Oh, I see. Because uh, they're kind of dickish, but not like official yeah. level. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have parrots in wildlife park moved after swearing at visitors. I remember that, that one. one. Love it. Love that one. Classic. And these seagulls who got someone basically banned from a hotel when they <laughs> oh, yeah. packed a suitcase full of pepperoni and <laughs> caused chaos in a hotel room. Yeah, I love it. Was, it was TNT pepperoni, so it was very spicy as well. <laughs> so those birds had a lot of indigestion. Uh, Lisa, mm. thank you so much. We love the best of bananas. We've got to have you back to do more. And we'll be posting these on our Instagram, right? Yep. That's the dealio. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm excited. Mm-hmm. The Bananas Podcast on Instagram. Follow us. Say hey. And now let's get back to the rest of Bananas. That was fun. That was fun. A little She's best of Bananas. She's doing a great job. We love Lisa Maggot. We love her intern. Thank you so much. Uh, you got any banana mail? Uh, I do. This was uh, sent in to us by Emily Sandy Telford. She says, not strange news, but I just wanted to share what I did. I'm an anatomy and physiology teacher in central Illinois. Usually we review anatomical terms and learn dissection techniques with pickles, but I switched Mm -hmm. it to bananas this year in honor of your podcast. I made a banana massacre, and students followed my directions to correctly do a banana autopsy. See the photos. They loved it. We will post the photos when this episode comes out. It's awesome. It looks so great. Everybody's like, peeling yes. open a banana and then like identifying things inside the banana it's very cool that's cool so thank you emily you thank are you emily so much a wonderful teacher you got anything else nope uh i'll do all mine real quick because of my jury duty i can't do door to shore on september 1st but we are at ten thousand dollars which is incredible door to shore i'm walking out my front door into the pacific ocean nonstop, 15.3 miles keep donating it's on our link tree on our instagram Thank you to everybody that's donated. I think over like 200 or 300 people have donated. That's awesome. You guys are great. It goes to Cast LA, which helps support people who are victims of human trafficking. Um, And I think that's it for me. But, oh, I'm going to reschedule. And as soon as there's a verdict and I'm out of court, I will probably do it the next available weekday. So door to shore will happen. Thank you, everybody. Oh, and East Banana Land. Uh, We're getting close, Kurt. I might drive out to New Mexico. All right to check out 40 acres in the mountains outside of Albuquerque that has electric and water hookup where we could build on it. And thank you to all the bananas who have been reaching out. We have an architect that's going to help us with zoning already. And we have a Disney Imagineer who designed signage and stuff for Disney who's going to help us make East Banana Land signs and bananas, statues, and all the good shit. That's amazing. uh, I think it's Detliff and Cameron. Thank you, guys. Thank you to everybody and Carly, our kick butt legal counsel. Thank you so much. We're going to make East Banana Land happen, guys. It's coming. I'm doing the best I can. I'm a little slowed down by being Atticus Finch. <laughs> All right. Here it is. Some scientists believe the universe is conscious. This was oh. sent in mm. by Bobo and Romeo. Thank you, Thank Bobo, you Bobo and Thank Romeo. You, Romeo. Uh, 
It's in Popular Mechanics, one of my favorite publications. <laughs> That's real. Uh, by the wonderful and fantastic Caroline Delbert. God damn, she's good. I she's know. awesome. She is maybe the best, best in the, the business. Damn business. Yeah, she's cool. All right, I will try. Uh, this is a very long article, and it's very theoretical. So I will just try. So's and everything get lately. It, right? okay. What isn't? Here it is. In upcoming research, scientists will attempt to show the universe has consciousness. Yes, mm-hmm. really. No matter the outcome, we'll soon learn more about what it means to be conscious and which objects around us might have a mind of their own. That's what cool. What will that mean for how we treat objects in the world around us? Buckle in because things are about to get weird. Mm-hmm. What is consciousness? Don't the know. The basic definition of consciousness intentionally leaves a lot of questions unanswered. It's, quote, the normal mental condition of the waking state of humans, characterized by the experience of perceptions, thoughts, feelings, awareness mm-hmm. of the o- external world, often in humans, uh, but nece- not necessarily in other animals, self-awareness. That's from the Oxford Dictionary of Psychology. Uh, and so scientists simply don't have one unified theory of what consciousness is. We also don't know where it comes from or what it's made of. That's true. Now, however, one loophole of this knowledge gap is that we can't exhaustively say other organisms and even inanimate objects don't have consciousness. You're right. Uh, humans relate to animals and can imagine, say, dogs and cats have some amount of consciousness because we see their facial expressions and how they yes. appear to make decisions. They but dream. It, exactly. Don't you love a dreaming dog? When a dog's running in its dreams, it might be the <laughs> funniest thing. I've gone down wormholes on YouTube just watching dogs running in their sleep. God, oh, yeah. it makes me laugh. Zelda will do it. But always, <laughs> Zeldas always seem deeply forlorn. Like she's running to catch a train that she's late for or something. Because she's going, and then she, her like her her bark is like it's there, but the mouth is closed. So it's like. <laughs> It's like, don't leave me. It's like, I don't remember my locker combination and yeah. the bell to homeroom rung. And yeah. Lauren, my wife, always wants to, like, wake her up and get her out of it. And I'm like, no, this is how she's processing the day. Like, you have to let her in it. But, yeah. but to be honest, neither of us fucking know. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing oh, might well. be to just give her a banana while it's happening. Thank you. Um, so. Basically, I'm not going to read this entire very academic article. But sure. We, this, we're, here, I'll get to this part. It's where physics enters the picture. Some scientists have posited that the thing we think of as consciousness is made of micro-scale quantum physics events and other I bet quote, it is. spooky I've been saying actions that forever. at a distance. <laughs> Kurt, I've been saying that since we met. The first thing Scotty said is like, I say, I said, hi, I'm Kurt. He said, Scotty Landis, do you know consciousness is made of microscale quantum physics events and other spooky actions at a distance? And I said, God damn, man, are you, you're right. Let, get, let's drink a beer. Yeah. And then I stuck my foot in a bucket, hopped around, knocked over the grill, <laughs> lit a tree on fire, <laughs> ran up the stairs. So they're going to attempt to study this in some way. So basically the... They, they um, um, imagine that consciousness is made of these, yeah, these quantum physics events, you know, yeah. spooky action at a diff- distance that are that we happen to have a lot of in our bodies, but yes. then a little bit of it exists everywhere else as well. Yep. So which gets us to this idea of like you know the Gaia theory of like the Earth as a living organism, which honestly, I kind of believe in my I believe in Mother Gaia a little bit. I do too. I'm kind of getting really into it. I've been reading this book um, that's like kind of explaining Gaia theory, and I'm like, I think this might be my religion. Like I'm that's cool. into this. Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. So anyway, they're gonna try and figure out if consciousness is. It's totally academic. It's completely theoretical. Yeah. Um, but Popular Mechanics does a great job of having a, a sentence like some scientists believe the universe is conscious and makes you read a whole bunch of stuff. And hey, I didn't know that they thought you know quantum physics was conscious. So that's whatever. cool. Well, that just makes things like alcohol and weed that much funnier, though, that you're, like, disrupting your consciousness with this poison that can be contained in bottles. Like, one of the times, not the time that you ended up naked, but one time when we were in New Orleans in a friend trip, it might have been night one, but we were leaving, we were walking up near Frenchman Street, and I was, there was a group, uh, it was like Oberg and Liz Bangs and all, it was everybody, yeah. Kristen, everybody. Uh, Lauren was definitely there, and we—I crossed Frenchman, and you were really drunk. You were as like you were 
maybe maybe top three drunkest I've ever seen you. And everybody's like, Kurt's really drunk. And I turn around, I'm like, nah, he's fine. Because we were having fun. We were all dancing. We were at Friendly's Bar in New Orleans. And uh, I was like, nah, he's fine. And Liz goes, really? Because I think he's like really wasted. I go, I don't think so. And then I turn around <laughs> and across the street, you fell backwards in this way that did not look painful. I don't know how you did it, but you fell sort of like back of your knees into your butt. Arms went above your head and your glasses flew directly off your head and down the street. <laughs> and you just laid on the ground with your arms above your like you're on a roller coaster, just <laughs> cracking up laughing. And I was like, we should get him back. Like instantly, I was like, you know, let's get a cab. I did see a cab up there let's go but it was so funny it was like you knew what was happening <laughs> nothing was stopping it everybody around was like everybody that didn't know you very well was like there's oh, shit. video of it there's video oh, really? of oberg then trying to pick me up and put me in a cab because uh, Kristen, of course just sat there was like i'm just gonna tape this and then just <laughs> taped it on her phone to show me the next morning yeah that is probably one of the drunkest i've ever been because yeah. that was the night that i time traveled so. oh it was that night it okay, was that yeah night. that was fantastic because yeah. i was i mean the words were leaving my lips oh he's fine i really don't think he's that and then it was just like <laughs> and there goes a sack of potatoes on the ground and then stands up and again and the way your glasses were popping off was I mean, you couldn't. It was like from an '80s comedy. They were yeah. just like, and then you put them back on. We're like, let's get them up, and then Kurt's going back down, and here they go again. <laughs> also, when a tall person falls, it's alarming. Do you know what I mean? Because yes. it, it takes a long time. It it's, did. <laughs> it's going. It happens in stages. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's like when you watch videos of like people cutting down a tree, and they pull that chainsaw out, and they're like, "Is it gonna go?" Yeah, and they don't want to. Oh, get them. That's my boy. We <laughs> so, made it. I was thinking, when I read this article, what it reminded me of, immediately uh-huh. for some reason, was college, obviously. Love it. I realized it. I'd never told this story of my very first class at college. No. And so... Johns uh, Hopkins, ladies and gentlemen. Kurt is a smart man. Johns uh, Hopkins University, Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland. Go Blue Jays. Don Scott, lacrosse coach. I don't... I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't... <laughs> I don't. I don't like to toot that horn, but um, I did for you. Thank you very much. So, I was sitting. Uh, I remember filling out like my first round of classes, and I had a language requirement, so I had to take a language. And I looked at all the languages, and I was like, I get to just choose a language because I didn't speak any languages. I took yeah. Latin in high school. I didn't learn a goddamn yeah. thing because the nope. teacher was a fucking moron. That's right. He was a brother. And just interrupt us. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, so I was like looking at it, and I had learned a little bit about um, like uh, Eastern cultures, specifically Japanese culture yes. in high school. And so I was like, oh, I could take Japanese. Yeah, that's and cool. As I'm about to like circle Japanese, and I was like in my head, and this is like one of my problems is that my reference points are not anyone else's reference points. I'm like... This is true. I'm like, everyone's gonna be taking Japanese. (laughs) I should be different, and I'll take Chinese instead. So I signed in Chinese. I don't know anything about uh, uh, the Chinese language or Chinese culture at the time. I'm 18 in New Jersey. So I go to my my very first class, 9 a.m. on a Monday after just getting to college, is Chinese 101, Intro to Chinese. Okay. I'm very excited. I sit down, and immediately I look around. I'm Mm -hmm. the only, I'm one of two non-Chinese people in the class. Good sign. And (laughs) and, And then the teacher immediately starts with opening. He opens the class with, what's your Chinese name? And... Everyone Whoa. has a Chinese name because I yes. think they they possibly have some history uh, with speaking Chinese at home. Yes. And so everyone says their Chinese name. And then I get to me and I'm like, I don't have a Chinese name. He's like, you don't have a Chinese name. And I was like, I don't. And I was like, I thought this was the introduction to Chinese. I thought yes. we would get a Chinese name. So he like gives me a Chinese name. Then there's the other white girl behind me. Mm-hmm. She has her Chinese name because she's been taking it in high school as well. And I'm just like, oh, already I'm like, I should not be in this class. I yes. made a mistake. Oh, boy. But I know then, that feeling. Yeah. I've been in those classes. You're like, oh, God. And you feel like an idiot yeah. for 45 minutes. 
And so I was like, okay, uh, so since I'm the only one who doesn't know anything, any Chinese at all in this class, I need to have a really good – so we could start going around and asking people, why do you want to uh, speak Chinese? Great. Uh, and I'm like, I have to have a real as as one of the one ca- one of two Caucasians in this room. I need to have a good reason for why I want to do this, right? Right. Yes, absolutely. So I'm like running through my brain. I was like, what's going to be my good reason? What's going to be my good reason? And everyone else's reason is because I'm Chinese. Uh, yeah. And it gets to me, and then I go um, because I would like to read Basho in his native tongue. <laughs> Oh, God. And for those of you who do not know. Oh, God. Basho is a Japanese poet. There you uh, go. And I mean, one of the biggest, like, cultural fuck-ups ever. And the the teacher was amazing. Either he legitimately had never heard of the poet Basho. Yes. Or... And also, fuck me for even choosing that answer. It's Crazy such a, answer. It's such a fucking like liberal I'm arts. Smart, yeah, yeah. I'm smart. I yes, know it things. Is. Uh, but you know, I was like, this is my my first day at college, and uh, and so either he legitimately had never heard of the poet Basho, or he was like, fuck this kid, because <laughs> oh, he then God. went Basho. Oh no, Basho. Oh, and then boy. walked around. I swear to God, Scott, oh, he walked God. around the class an entire <laughs> loop going, Basho. <laughs> Basho? Basho. Wow. Basho? And well. then finally stops and goes, does anyone know who Basho is? Oh, he no. had to have known. He had to have known. It, oh, and of course, God. the white girl behind me goes, he's a Japanese poet. Oh, boy. And the guy goes, Kurt, looks like you're in the wrong class. And I said, yes, it does. I got up (laughs) right there. I walked out of the class, and I never went back. (laughs) You walked directly to New Jersey and got in your childhood (laughs) bed. Oh, and just, bud. And just and just quaked. Oh, I tried man. to do it. I tried to be the the smart kid at college, and it failed. And then that oh. would be that would be repeated for me uh, one thousand times at college. Basho. Basho. Oh, Basho. I the I have a really short similar experience where I I was at this little acting conservatory that I've mentioned before, and we had to study Shakespeare. I don't know why they do that to every actor. I have no idea. So we're doing it, and this one actor is affecting this British accent so poorly. And the teacher was an American teacher, and she goes, uh, "Excuse me, Michael, what are you doing?" Um, you don't have to do a British accent. He goes, oh, I just wanted to do it in the native, in Shakespeare's native tongue. So very similar answer to what you had. And the teacher, and I used to sound way more from Maryland than I do now. And the teacher goes, no, no, no. When Shakespeare was alive, they sounded more like Scott. They sounded just like Scott. Scott, say something. And I was like, what do you want me to say? She goes, they sounded like that. That's what they sounded like in Shakespeare's day. So you should try to sound, and I wanted to be like, 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 (laughs) <laughs> a hillbilly like i was like what are you talking about but it was the kid was so human he was so oh i'm so sophisticated <laughs> and meanwhile i'm like oh yeah i would love to hang out with you after give me your cell phone number and we'll go somewhere and she's like that is shakespeare <laughs> oh hamlet oh hamlet hamlet I- hon oh god where's othello where's othello he's running around like the wild man of borneo um Okay, I got one for you, homeboy. Great. Courtney Farver underscore underscore sent this in. It might only be one underscore. I think Courtney sent stuff in before. Thank you, Courtney. Um, man uses first class ticket to eat for free at airport's VIP lounge for almost an entire year. What? Oh, he just kept rescheduling it? Bingo. So this was New York Post written by David Key, uh, excuse me, David K. Lee. A man in China purchased a first class plane ticket and used it to eat a year's worth of free meals in the VIP lounge at uh, their international airport. I'm going to think it's Xi'an. I'm going with Xi'an or Xi'an International Airport. The frequent diner purchased a first-class, fully refundable ticket aboard Eastern China Airline. He used the ticket to gain access to the airport's VIP lounge, where high-rolling travelers dine for free, according to a report last week in a Chinese-language newspaper. 
The man rebooked his first class ticket over and over and over again to keep the gravy train rolling. Good writing, David. You yes. are the best in the business. Uh, Eastern China Airlines officials only figured out the man's scheme after noticing his single ticket being rebooked 300 times wow. in one year. Wow. Airline official times. That means he's going almost every day. <laughs> almost every day. Airline officials admitted there was nothing they could do to stop the frequent diner. He wasn't doing anything illegal. He just found a loophole. We love a loophole on the Bananas Love a loophole. Podcast. I love this guy. God. A spokeswoman for the air carrier called the man's free meal scheme a rare act. Still, Eastern China officials <laughs> confronted him, and the human meal ticket had to stop chowing down. The freeloader ended up cashing in his fully refundable ticket and getting back all of his money yes <laughs> so this guy is a genius so he figured out that if you have a first class ticket and so he really ate free for an entire year i'm hoping it's good airport food i mean you it can't it can't be that good it also like Think about the amount of time he had to spend it's incredible. just to save the money. He it's had, incredible. He had to go to the airport, go through security, yes. then go and then just exit and then call the airline, rebook the ticket for the next yes. day. Yeah. He'd be better off going at like 5 a.m. and then just staying all day in the yeah. VIP lounge and just making a whole day of it, which is always the funniest thing you can do. I love this guy that he found it, and I love that he got a full refund on the end. He won. It's amazing. Oh, he totally won. He totally won. He had, His commitment, he lost so much time. He lost so much time of his life. I, I hope it was worth it for the uh, the deli slices of meat that they had mm. and mm. Uh, maybe a quiche in the morning. I don't know. Mm. I have no idea what they had. Yeah, we don't know. But if he's retired, it does put a spin on it. If oh, it's is he retired? No, it didn't say oh. but if he was and this He's is just how time. he messes with the system yes i like that i'm down if my you're tired and you got a yeah. plan to get some free food yeah, yes i'm back my I'm buddy's back dad <laughs> retired when i worked at the bike shop my buddy's dad retired because my dad retired three days ago i go oh that's good congratulations he goes he's already called me twice in the last three days to let me know which gas station has the cheapest gas in our town <laughs> i go that's retirement he's in it this dude's in it all right i gotta tell this story Kirk. Uh, you've seen Pan's Labyrinth, right? Uh, of course. Great movie. Yep, if little, anybody has Pan's on eyeballs. That's or, where I'm going. Yeah. Thank you. That's where I'm going for that guy. Yeah. Okay. So, when I was a wee lad, when I was like 12 or 13 in Reisterstown, Maryland, I lived on Waywood Drive. That was oh, the name of my street. Class. Waywood Drive. I mean, you can't. You can't beat Waywood Drive. And I just like when I came to New York and was hanging out with you guys, I always hung out with people that were like a few years older than me. So all these teenagers were around. And it was summer break. Yeah, I think I was like 12 or 13. And these two guys who were truly the Beavis and Butthead of our crew, Monts, one was a monster stoner, monster druggie in every way. The other one was a little more straight laced, but kind of a, a goofball. They got a job working at Boardwalk French Fries in Hunt Valley Mall. So for people that don't know, Boardwalk Fries is a chain of restaurants that's mostly in the Mid-Atlantic. I think they're in New Jersey, too. And it's, you, it's mostly you just go buy French fries. And yeah. they're square-cut fries. They're delicious. People go to the mall just to get them. It's a real thing in Maryland. So they're a hit. So these two guys go. They get high. They, they go all summer long. Oh, by the way, they get fired. This story takes place within about three weeks. The okay. whole thing from hiring to firing. So I go to the mall, and they're there. And, I mean, you couldn't have hired bigger bozos. Um, and so just imagine. I know one of them. I won't name names, but one of them. Well, let's make some fake names. Give me a, a name, Kurt. Max and Can. Can. Uh, Max, a little more responsible. Can, I know, for sure, dropped acid while working at a French fry <laughs> store in the mall food court. I like this guy already. Yeah, exactly. So... After two days of work, they realized that the managers were never going to be there. It was just up to them to open and close every day. They worked doubles every single day. They brought home a grocery bag of French fries. A grocery bag. Like a full-size <laughs> brown paper bag leaking oil through the sides with, I would guess, 35 oh, pounds okay. of French <laughs> like they fries made, they were made. They weren't like frozen and they brought them no. home to make them at home. No, made they them. deep fried. <laughs> <laughs> and then filled it back. 
So we're playing an impossible you know, amount to eat in one sitting. At what, right. However, you try. Okay. So there were tons of us younger guys there in high school. So my my neighbor was a real free for all. Everybody's playing sports in each other's backyards and flashlight tag. So they come in and they are like gods. They are like returning from war with spoils. And about eight to ten of us just demolish this bag. So then every night in the summer before we play flashlight tag, Can would bring home. A grocery bag of French fries. And for these three weeks, we were in heaven. It was paradise. Everybody, like half the people are super stoners. Half of us are just like out and about fishing and running through the woods all day. We're starving kids. Yeah. So one day, I ride my bike up the street and I go in the house. You know, it was very open doors back then. And my best friend, Ken's younger brother, was not there. So I walk in the house. I'm like, what's up? And I walk in. I just hear laughter. So I go inside, and there uh, is Can sitting in the living room with uh, his shirtless. Mm-hmm. He's uh, 16. He, he's sitting, on, and he has his boogie board, a BZ something, mm-hmm. BZ Benti, or some BZ thing he was so proud of, on the coffee table. And on the coffee table is a grocery bag overflowing with French fries. <laughs> Can is watching a blank TV screen, laughing hysterically. <laughs> it's dusk. I was just thinking we were all going to hang out and eat some French fries. Yeah. I was a 12-year-old riding my bike around looking for some free fries. Well, I found him, and so I go, hey, and he doesn't look. He's just laughing. I go, hey, Ken, where's uh, younger brother's name? And he goes, oh, hey, Scott. Uh, uh, my mom took him to get new soccer cleats. I go, oh, okay. And he just turns back and starts laughing at a blank TV screen. His eyes are huge. He's tripping balls in a way that is indescribable. But I really want these French fries. <laughs> <laughs> so I just start inching closer and closer to the fries. <laughs> so then I get to the sofa and he looks at me. Like his eyes shoot to me. Like so scary. Like demon eyes. Yeah. And, he, and I'm go, what, do you, what, do you, what are you watching? And he goes, just reruns. And then looks back at the TV, starts cracking up. So then I'm inching closer and closer to a laughing lunatic. Like he's so high on acid, it's crazy. And he's just, and he hasn't touched the fries. I don't know. Do people on acid eat a lot? I, no, I would imagine no, you eat no, nothing, no, right? No, yeah, no, you eat no, nothing. No, it's very upsetting yes. to put things in your mouth. This house smells like French fries. I mean, it is 30-something pounds of fries. So I am inching closer and closer to a laughing teenager shirtless with the fries on a boogie board. And I just slowly am reaching my hand so he can't see it out of the corner of my eye. Then he stops laughing. He just oh. stops. Oh. Huh. And I look at him, and he's looking at the screen. And then in the screen, I can see he's looking at the reflection of me <laughs> reaching for the French fries. <laughs> and I go, Ken, can I have some of these French fries? And he just starts laughing. And I took a handful as big as like a baseball mitt yeah. and just backed out of that room <laughs> while he laughed and ran out to my bike and rode down with one hand on my hand eating just French eating, fries. Just eating a fist of French fries. It was like that scene in Pan's Labyrinth with the hand where it was like <laughs> just don't t- I felt like I was running a gauntlet I didn't know if he was going to kill me it was like probably why Especially I write horror movies 12. now you all know? I wanted was those fries <laughs> <laughs> I was willing to risk it all for some boardwalk french fries oh I love that I love that so much boardwalk fries give us a sponsorship we'll shout you out come on give me boardwalk a small wave fries? give me a big wave with old bay and malt vinegar Mm. Oh, man. Can, I hope you're still out there. You know who you are. You know who you are. And that boogie board will come back to a later story at a later time, Kirk. Oh, I like that. Can love that boogie board. <laughs> <laughs> so we got an update, Scotty. Bingo. Owner of Demonic Chihuahua says adoption ad was accurate. <laughs> oh, But shoot. she has no regrets. This was sent in by Brandy Baxter. Thanks, Brandy Baxter. This was uh, on Today. Uh, That's by, real. Written by Jen Reader. I love that Jen Reader. She's a reader and a writer. Good writer. 
when Ariel Davis adopted a two-year-old Chihuahua. So for anyone who doesn't remember this, there was an ad placed mm-hmm. that essentially, <laughs> it, it, I guess it goes into it here. I, I'll just read. When Ariel sure. Davis adopted a two-year-old Chihuahua named Prancer in April, she, she, she assumed he might have devilish tendencies. After all, the tongue-in-cheek adoption ad penned by his foster, Tiffany Fortuna, of Second Chance Pet Adoption League in New Jersey, described him as, quote, demonic, like a, quote, haunted Victorian child. Mm-hmm. Or a quote Chucky doll in a dog's body. Uh, there's not a very big market for neurotic man hating animal hating children <laughs> hating dogs that look like gremlins. The ad noted. Mm-hmm. But when Davis introduced Prancer to her home in New Haven, Connecticut, he seemed surprisingly tame while settling mm-hmm. in for the first couple weeks. It was a short-lived respite for oh, what was to no. come. No. Quote, at the second week, he was like, all right, it's cool. I think I can start coming out of my shell now, Davis 36 told today. Quote, I definitely started to see a lot of behaviors that had been advertised in the ad by the lovely Uh, Tiffany. uh, She was very accurate. We had a couple of (laughs) run-ins with men that were embarrassing. Uh, With help from trainers, Davis is working to help Prancer feel safe and to understand he doesn't need to protect her. Good guy. Protect him. Uh, quote, if nobody's looking at him or trying to pet him or drawing attention to him, he'll just walk around shaking his little butt, sniffing the floor and minding his own business. Perfect. But it's pet. when you make eye contact or draw attention to him that he feels threatened. Oh, God. So it's really just so she takes him to work and then tells everyone to not pay attention to him. So this is like at work. Well, it's that's like, there's a, a mistake. There's a devil animal running around that yeah, you're not allowed to look at. <laughs> this is an HR complaint. This is a law suit waiting to happen don't take this little demon dog to work but she's been dressing him up lots of pictures i mean he's also like a famous dog has ninety five thousand instagram followers i mean and hilarious she says that it, what's kind of cool about it is that the demeanor of dog has helped lift her out of depression about the pandemic she loves the adorable way his face seems to scrunch into a Aww. smile when he's happy and i will tell you one thing scotty there are many photos of this dog in this okay. article in not a single one does this dog look like he's happy <laughs> or smiling <laughs> he's giving a death stare in every single one. <laughs> well um, it certainly takes your mind off of things i can yeah, see that yeah exactly and then this is the last little part which is kind sure. of heartwarming quote people wanted pictures of because of the dog is famous people wanted pictures of me and i don't even want to look in the mirror she said so having this companion lets me say i want to take better care of myself i've started to take steps looking into what i need to do to change things that i'm not happy about with myself and i have prancer to keep me going i come home every day and see this little man that's my inspiration to wake up the next day and do it so okay pretty wonderful prancer's doing his job on this earth Prancer's a great name for that dog. If it no makes kidding. you happy, we're we're huge fans of it. Whatever it takes to get by, we're fans. Yeah. Good we'll for Prancer. It. Do you want to give us just one little uh, teaser and we'll get on out of this episode? I'm going to give you, I'm going to finish one that I started a couple eppies back. Yes. Mickey Mouse, MM Mouse, sent this in. 97 year old woman's headstone includes her favorite fudge recipe. Hell this yeah. Is, yeah, I got to get through it. So I'm going to bomb through it because it's so beautiful. Uh, Fox 13 News staff, best in the biz when it comes to Logan, Utah's local news. While most cemetery headstones give you a small glimpse into the lives of the people buried there, they usually don't catch your eyes like this one does. Utah's Logan Cemetery contains the headstone of Wade and Catherine Andrews, along with their birth and death dates. Uh, but the story you'll find, or her life story etched on the side, is Catherine's famous fudge recipe. Kay, this. as her nickname was, would take fudge wherever she went whenever people got together. That is so badass. We love you, yes. Kay. Rest in fudge. We love that. Kay and Way were members of the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. They are in Utah. This is not shocking. Uh, and they met at a church function in New York City where she, when she had moved from Utah to study fashion design. Hey, now. All right. Okay. The two. She, de- had, she designed Fudgy the Whale. <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, they had, The two had time for just one date. They had dinner at the Waldorf Astoria. Pretty good date. Uh, and a hotel photographer took one photo of the couple. The next day, Wade was a U.S. Air Force captain, went to World War II. She Whoa. was crazy about him, Kurt, from the beginning. Uh, though they only had one date, the feeling was mutual for Wade as well. 
The couple exchanged dozens of letters. When he returned home, he promptly bought a ring and proposed to her. They're married 18 days later. These two wow. do not mess they around. They do not mess around. They're boom, 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 boom. With the a world fu- war in between. Yeah, the Fudge Andrews couple, they really get to the <laughs> point. So um, they blah, 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 all good stuff. Uh, Kay passed away in 2019 at the age of 97. A Classic. good, a quality, good fudge-filled life for Kay Andrews. I mean, like that's what I mean. Like, I guess, I guess what we learned from this is that you can eat fudge every day and live to uh, yep. 97. That's what yes. I'm taking away. From Secret that. of life is eat fudge every day and give fudge to other people, and you're gonna make the Century Club. You're just gonna. Here's the full recipe as written on the headstone. Also, if anybody lives near Logan. Utah, and you want to respectfully go pay your respects to Kay and take a photo in front of the recipe, we will share it on our Instagram oh, story. Yeah. Just keep it above board. Show some respect for the Fudgy Andrews. We love them. Kay's Fudge. Two squares chocolate. Two tablespoons of butter. Melt on low heat. St- this is on the tombstone, by the way. Okay. What I'm reading is on the tombstone. Melt on low heat. Stir in one cup milk. Bring to boil. Three cups sugar. One teaspoon vanilla. Pinch of salt. There's a little shocker. Mm, I like that. Cook to softball stage. Don't know what that means. Pour on marble <laughs> slab. Cool and beat and eat. And if that is not on mine, I don't want to die. I want Scotty Landis. Cool and beat and, and eat. eat. The best last line on a tombstone ever. Rest in peace, Kay and Wade. May your fudge make people happy till the end of time. God damn. Thank you, Scotty, for again you, another B. wonderful episode. I'll see you in Denver this weekend, homeboy. We're going to have so much fun. I'm very, very, very excited. Thanks I'm for excited coming out too. again. You're you good got man. it, dude. Um, Bananimals keep sending in those beautiful stories. Keep sending us pics of hashtag unexpected bananas. If you see a banana out in the wild, let us know. We'll share it on our Instagram stories. You guys are the best. Thank you, Katie Levine. Uh, thank you to uh, our intern, Lisa Maggot, and our benevolent overlords, Karen and Georgia. Love them. This has been an Exactly Right production. Produced and engineered by Katie Levine. Theme music by Kahan. And all of our artwork is done by Travis Millard. You can follow us on Instagram at The Bananas Podcast, where we post stories every day and things that we don't cover on the podcast. Listen, subscribe, and please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. And if you're interested in advertising on Bananas, please email us at thebananaspodcast at gmail.com. That's thebananaspodcast at gmail.com. 